So just uh, a little bit of introduction about uh, Electra uh, now and the future of Electra. We are a company. Uh, we are a company with shareholders, which are all public research organizations. The majority of shareholders is Care Science Park, the Regional Government of Fruit and Venezia Giulia, the National Research Council. We've been around as a company for uh, many years, 30 years, uh, with a high sounding mission to promote cultural and socioeconomic growth at the regional, national, international level. The mission is state of the art research facility open to everybody, to academia, to, the, uh, to research in academia, research in companies, uh, technical leadership, uh, skill development and transfer. We are a, a small entity. We have a staff of about 370 people, uh, and, but there are about 100 people which are trainees, postdocs, and they rotate every uh, two or three years. Uh, the, in addition to this, we have uh, uh, it's about, about 150 scientists on site, which are not on our payroll. They are on the payroll of other universities, other institutions, CNR, <coughs> international institutions. And we cost uh, taxpayers, European taxpayers, something like 20, 56 million euros. Out of this, we are, we are a non-profit company. We are, we, we are allowed to do a little bit of commercial activities, but it has to be a minor aspect of our activity. So imagine that something like 5% of this amount comes to fund from commercial activities. We run two uh, light sources. This is called Electra. Uh, it's a, a 2.4 giga electron volt uh, third generation light source, which has been around almost 20 years, which means it is still fairly competitive, but after 20 years, it's about time that we rebuild uh, in the machine, uh, Electra. Uh, and then uh, uh, this is the new light source, which is a free electron laser called Fermi. And I will say a few words about Electra and a few words about Fermi as an introduction to what is available for life science research. You all know how these things, these machines work. You got relativistic electrons running around at the speed of light in the, in the facility. And then you go, send them to magnetic fields, okay? Alternating magnetic fields, north, south, north, south. And the relativistic particle will oscillate and will shine, will produce light in a very tightly focused beam with a high brightness along the tangent <coughs> to the trajectory. Uh, and the reason why every single uh, country in Europe has its own third generation light source facility is because the brightness of this source for X-rays is about 10 billion times brighter than any conventional X-ray source. So as you know, a lot of measurements that you need to do on materials and need to be done at synchrotron radiation light sources, okay? They are, and every country in Europe has it, almost every advanced country in Europe has its own facility. No offense, uh, I will tell you more about countries that do not have their facilities and they've invested on our facility. Uh, so high brightness, especially in the X-ray and uh, extended ultraviolet <coughs> range, uh, with all kinds of different applications. Now, for third generation light source, you get this, uh, this round shape, okay, you get a linear accelerator that brings uh, to a booster synchrotron, and then you send electrons around the storage ring, and every time there is one of these magnetic devices, you get the radiation that gets to the beam line and then to the experimental hole, okay? That's what third generation light sources look like. And the Electra has 27 beam lines in operation. Uh, and here you see a diagram that shows the 27 beam line, and you see like, lots of different marks here. We have a business plan which is fairly unique in terms of, of facility of this type. You go to uh, the UK facility in Oxford, it's called Diamond, it's also a company, and you will find about 20, 30 beam lines, which are owned by the UK government, okay? You go to France, and you go to Paris, where there is Soleil, another facility, and all the beam lines are owned and operated by uh, uh, the French, French institutions. Uh, we uh, decided to do something different. Because of the limited amount of funding we have at our disposal, we decided that uh, we own about half of the beam line and uh, the other half of the beam line uh, have been actually constructed and they are supported through a uh, different agreement with different type of organization. For example, the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, uh, has funded the establishment of an X-ray fluorescence beam line 
and has a program that supports users from uh, materials research from the International Atomic Energy Agency community that come and run experiment at any of our facilities, at any of our beam line. UNESCO, through ICPP, has funded the establishment of an X-ray absorption fine structure beam line, but has also a program that supports access of hundreds of fellows uh, from developing countries uh, to access all of our beam line. Okay, so you see beam lines here. You see two recent beam lines: one for X-ray diffraction for protein, and one for X-ray diffraction of materials under high uh, pressure <coughs> with a diamond anvil. And there is an Indian flag because they have been supported, they have been funded and supported by the Indian government through the Department of Science and Technology, DST. Uh, the idea is uh, we have contract with all of these agencies, all of these institutions, and they all uh, say the same. You basically, uh, they fund the construction of the beam line, they fund the operation of the beam line, they have to support the staff scientists from their institution. At the same time, we provide them with uh, photons with beam, with beam time. One third of the beam time is for in-house research from German, uh, Romanian, Austrian institution. One third of the beam time is for uh, uh, user access to peer review from Austrian users, uh, uh, Czech Republic users, uh, German users, Indian users. And one third of the time is for service to the international community. So Italian scientists or, or uh, Austrian scientists or whatever can access any of these facilities, any of these beam lines for experiments free of charge if they publish the results in the open literature. For proprietary research for companies that do not want to uh, subject their proposal to the scrutiny of uh, uh, our peer review committee, then we charge a commercial uh, uh, fee uh, in order to recover the cost. So each beamline has its own application, has its own energy range, has its own techniques. Uh, many of them are under upgrade, for example, TwinMeek, which is a beamline uh, which is receiving a new uh, ambulator to extend the uh, uh, energy range available for microscopy and X-ray fluorescence application. The infrared beamline in the Lisa, Lisa is there, okay. The infrared beamline is receiving a new uh, facility uh, that, that will boost, uh, <coughs> let's say, it's kind of AFM type of mount, let's say for the sample, that will boost the, the, the resolution for, X, for infrared microscopy at, uh, of orders of magnitude to, to respect to conventional uh, synch uh, um, synchronous radiation microscopy with infrared and so the now spectroscopy beam line is being upgraded, the X-ray fluorescence beam grind is being upgraded. We have still a negotiation in place with Iran. Uh, uh, the, Ir the Iranian uh, light source facility, uh, which is being supposed to be built in Katz Bin, 150 kilometers away from uh, Tehran, uh, would like to prepare the scientists and the technicians required to run the new facility by opening up and funding a new uh, beamline for X-ray absorption fine structure, let's say EXAS, uh, here at uh, uh, ELECTA. We've been negotiating this uh, for a while because of the sanction uh, complication and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, we have an agreement with ICPP uh, in the sense that if this thing happened, the long-term visitors will be long-term visitors of ICTP, and then they will be operating the new beam line uh, here with uh, a, a, a being permanently here. So, as I said, we have about 150 staff scientists from CNR, from, from uh, uh, India, from Germany on site, which uh, uh, are helping us run some of the beam line. Uh, the user community, you can access uh, through peer review, so you submit the proposal, and you see we, we, we receive about a thousand proposals per year. Uh, you explain what you want to do. You, you, you propose to use a certain beam line, and you have a chance out of two or a chance out of three of being selected and obtain beam time. I Italian institutions account for about 40% of our electro users, and you see major uh, uh, contribution from India, Germany, from countries, Austria, countries that have their own beam line here. Okay. And so 
So we, we are by far the most international of this type of facility in Europe right now. Uh, we have a plan for upgrading the whole machine, which is called, boringly, Electra 2.0. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we had a more sexier acronym, but that was stolen from us. Uh, the idea was to call this machine Iris, because in Greek mythology, the daughter of Electra is uh, Iris. Unfortunately, the National Institute for Nuclear Physics uh, developed a project for a superconducting linear collider in Frescati, and they called that iris. And there was no way. I complained bitterly, saying, look, it's a linear collider, and there is no arrow. <laughs> OK? Uh, it, it, it's a collider. There is no C. So obviously, you're just stealing the acronym for no other reason than you know, to upset us. Fortunately, that project was not funded. So in a few, when we will inaugurate a new machine, we'll call it iris. But for the time being, for the time being it's Electra 2.0. The idea is that uh, this is a, a piece of the machine uh, <coughs> with two bending magnets. The current machine has for each arc two bending magnets. And you can, we propose to the ministry to change and go to a multi-band acromat lattice, which replaces two bending magnets in green with six bending magnets uh, with another straight section. This will uh, allow us to do two things. A, reconstruct the machine and uh, the, the, it's 20 years old, and now we're going to be able to actually have a new machine. B is going to go towards the ultimate brightness <laughs> limit that you can achieve with these machines. So these are going to be the upgrade of, of all the existing third-generation light sources towards what the diffraction limit storage ring. We are all going to try to upgrade the machine to the ultimate theoretical limit, and we will be gaining to at least two orders of magnitude in brightness, okay? The project has, this is what you can see here, this is, for example, the brightness that you achieve from one of our uh, beam lines. This is the infrared, and this is the hard X-rays, and here is what you get as a function of photon energy, and, uh, uh, and this is what the new machine is going to do. Uh, it, it much higher brightness in, uh, in the uh, soft X-ray and in the, in the X-ray range, and that's what we want to do. So this is what we proposed to the uh, to the ministry, and uh, this was actually funded. We uh, we received we will be receiving 170 million euro in the next few years to rebuild completely rebuild the machine. Uh, let's be clear about this: the old machine will operate until July 2nd, 2025. In the meantime, we'll be constructing the element of the new machines. When we will be ready, we'll shut down the old machine, remove the old machine, and put in place the new machine. So in principle, the dark time will be only two semesters, one year, if we're lucky. It's, I say if we're lucky because all of the European synchronous radiation light sources have an upgrade plan, but ours is only the third one which has been funded. So we need to... to to be experimentalist in this and say, yes, the ESRF is being upgraded, MAX4 in Sweden is being upgraded. They all claim two semesters, so we claim two semesters. Let's hope that this is going to be what happens in the future. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, but the ELECTA, the current ELECTA, what I'm going to discuss now, it will be operating all the way to July 2nd, 2025. There'll be a one year shutdown, and then the new machine upgraded machine with two orders magnitude higher brightness will be take, being in charge. Will be. Now a few words about another machine, which is Fermi. <laughs> Fermi is a free electron laser source, uh, the only, uh, which operates in the extended ultraviolet and the soft X-ray range. Uh, it, these, there are only four of them uh, currently operating uh, in the world in the X-ray, but there are new ones being, uh, up, being opened up in uh, there are three under construction in China. Uh, there is uh, one being uh, uh, um, LCLS2 in the US being, uh, being, uh, in, being constructed right now. There are two in Germany, uh, and this is the Italian one. It's, it's a free electron laser source. It operates in entirely in a completely different way. There's a linear accelerator <coughs> that brings electrons from 0 to 1.5 and 1.8 uh, billions of electron volts of energy. 
Then you send them to a series of magnetic devices, okay? You got, this is FEL1, and these are the magnetic devices of FEL1. This is the FEL2, and these are the magnetic devices of FEL2. So you send these electrons, relativistic electrons, in one of these uh, magnetic devices. You, you extract radiation from the oscillations of the oscillating electrons, and then you send this radiation to a series of other magnets uh, that amplify the harmonic, uh, uh, the higher harmonics of, the, of these oscillators. So here is the first oscillator, and here are the amplifiers. Uh, this is FEL1, and this is FEL2, in which you have two sets in series of these oscillator amplifier, another oscillator amplifier, higher harmonic. This is optimized for extended ultraviolet radiation. This is optimized for all soft X-rays, up to four, three nanometer, but hopefully we'll be able to push it to one, two nanometers. Now, what this is, is called a free electron laser in the sense that uh, what you are actually exploiting is the fact that the radiation emitted by the electrons, it's used to stimulate the emission of more radiation. So you, you, you extract radiation, then you send the radiation so that it gets superimposed and remains superimposed to electrons, and so the electrons, through stimulated emission, will emit more and more intensity. This is a phenomenon well known. It's called light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, laser. But in a conventional laser, you are limited to one frequency, which is the frequency of the band gap of the semiconductor device, which is of the material, which is radiating the energy. Here you're using, a, as a lasing medium, you're using a beam of electrons, and you change the energy by changing the electron energy and changing the intensity of the magnetic field. These are called free electron lasers. They're the only laser that produce coherent radiation in the extreme, extreme ultraviolet or in the X-rays. It's a military technology. It was actually developed at the time of the Strategic Defense Initiative by Ronald Reagan. Fortunately, it was never utilized to shoot down a ballistic missile it's now used for spectroscopy, microscopy, and diffraction, and crystallography. We, it's a linear machine, uh, so you can do only one experiment at a time. We have five beam lines, one uh, for doing diffraction and projection imaging, one for doing low density cluster physics and chemistry, one for doing magnetic dynamics, and so forth. But you can do only one experiment at a time. So if you apply for, for beam time on Fermi, you will have a chance out of five or six to get beam time. It's much harder to get beam, line, beam time on these machines. A, there are fewer of them in the world right now. B, uh, they can only do one experiment at a time. So that's, uh, that's expensive. Uh, but, any, but as I said, uh, the number of these facilities will keep increasing. Uh, these are lasers, OK? We don't need a monochromator. You, you, you have just one wavelength that you can tune by changing the energy of the electrons and the intensity of the magnetic field. And uh, this one we show just to upset our German colleagues. This is the emission of Fermi at a wavelength of 26.4 nanometers. And this is the uh, emission from the flash German free electron laser at the same energy. We see one wavelength line width, and, uh, and here you see many different uh, uh, components uh, and intensity will fluctuate and the line width will fluctuate. This is actually because out of the existing free electron laser, Fermi is the only one that utilizes a, a, a mechanism called seeding. Uh, seeding implies, uh, whoops, sorry, seeding, seeding uh, implies that uh, uh, when you are oscillating in the, in the oscillator, Rather than using the spontaneous emission due to the oscillation of the electron due to the magnetic field, like every other facility it's doing right now, uh, we shine a laser, a conventional laser, uh, on top of these in order that the first emission, it's not a spontaneous emission, but it's a stimulated emission. So we are actually starting with stimulated emission and amplifying the stimulated emission. The only result is that you have absolute stability, high stability in wavelength, line width, and intensity. This is a mechanism that is called seeding. All the other facilities, except Shanghai under construction, 
are using instead spontaneous amplified emission, SASE, and this that gives you <coughs> high intensity but totally but, uh, but unreproducible uh, with unstable line width and uh, intensity. And this is why if you look at the users that are accessing uh, free electron laser, uh, you see that there are a huge number of German users, French users, UK users, countries that have their own free electron lasers. But if you want free electron laser with stability, line width, intensity, the only game in town is it's Fermi. And that's why you got to come to Fermi to do any kind of resonant excitation. Okay, uh, so summarizing. You, there is a letter uh, close by, just a few minutes by drive, and you have lots of different sources for the different uh, beam lines, uh, high intensity going from the infrared to the hard X-ray. You need to monochromatize with a monochromator the wavelength you need. And these emission curves, these brightness curves, are 10 billion times brighter than conventional X-ray sources. Then there's Fermi. Fermi has uh, 10 billion times higher brightness, peak brightness. Any impulse of Fermi uh, is about 5 gigawatt of peak power in 20 to 30 femtosecond line width. Uh, and you change the uh, line width and position by changing the intensity of the magnetic field, OK? You, you, you don't need a monochromator. It's a laser, OK? OK, OK. Now, the intensity of these spots is so high that you basically vaporize within a picosecond everything you hit, which brings down the number of medical applications of free electron laser because medical doctors don't like to vaporize their patients in the beginning. But uh, you can take a picture of your image, your sample, you can take a picture of your cell, you can take a diffraction of your molecule uh, within a few hundreds of femtoseconds. And then whatever you have actually image will explode by a much longer time. So here there are limitations to what you can do. But for high brightness, for phenomena which are very fast on the femtosecond time scale, you have to use free electron laser sources. For phenomena that are on the picosecond time scale or longer, or then come to electron. Okay? This is one peer review, one probability out of two or three. Here is one out of five, six, seven, depending on what you want to do. We do a little bit of commercial activities. So these are some of our clients that are using the labs or the beam lines that for doing, and we charge these people. So we have an income that comes from commercial activity, from Brembo, from, that, from all of these companies, Brack and so forth. And if you look at what they do uh, with our beam line, for 39% of our revenue comes from structural characterization of biomolecule or nanostructural material. 40% of our revenues from companies is for this. 19% comes from chemical characterization of organic materials. 17% and growing, I should say, so that uh, Paula Storici doesn't get upset to me. 17% uh, comes from biotechnology and protein expression. Code, the analysis, chemical analysis of coding and thin film and surface is 13%. 9% only for X-ray tomography. We believe that that's going to be an area of large increase <coughs> in the future. Uh, Electro 2.0, for Electro 2.0, will heavily invest in this type of application, X-ray tomography, and uh, a few other applications. So this is what the practical impact for commercial users uh, of, of synchrotron radiation facility looks like uh, for electron. Uh, just a few examples of research. Uh, let's start with one uh, result from XRD1. XRD1, it's a beam line devoted to X-ray diffraction. And uh, here is an example of work done on uh, drug polymorphism. Uh, it's, a, it's work done in collaboration with a, with a um, pharmaceutical group. And the idea is, by uh, looking at, at uh, uh, with high resolution, high intensity synchronization uh, in X-ray diffraction, uh, we can actually uh, have a much higher sensitivity to more polymorphic uh, species than available with a conventional light source. Okay, and uh, we can actually look at uh, uh, the presence of unwanted polymorphic forms uh, at the level of uh, 50 parts per million. 
uh, and this will allow us to do process control during seeding, but also uh, controlling the final products for unwanted polymorphs. Also, we can actually uh, look at uh, looking at the number of polymorphs present in the in the drug. We can sort of get an idea of what the process of synthesis that was utilized, and so there is also a patent infringement aspect for the utilization of this uh, type of techniques. We actually got a patent for this for the, the, for the use of uh, uh, actually patent <laughs> techniques to identify the different polymorph and uh, the, the the type of synthesis, and uh, it's a pro it, it's a patent together with the Zambon group. And the demonstration that it's a useful patent is that we immediately, Novartis and Siemens filed a lawsuit against us to, to void the patent, okay? And I'm happy to say that we actually won the first in front of a court, and so the patent is still there, although Novartis is appealing against the decision, but we'll see what happens. And that's the best proof that it's a useful patent. If it's a useful patent, somebody's going to immediately file a lawsuit against them to try to avoid the patent. If nobody does that, then it's probably not very useful. So, anyway. So, uh, another beamline, which is, uh, uh, which is called XRB2, <laughs> is uh, the most advanced state-of-the-art beamline we have for uh, macromolecular crystallography. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, actually one of those two beam lines funded by the DST in India, co-funded and operated by Indian scientists and Italian scientists. Here there is Annie Heru, which is not an Italian scientist actually, not yet. She is from Canada, but she is in charge of that beam line, and she's operating uh, hand in hand with a with a with an Indian uh, colleague, uh, which is operating the same beam line. Uh, and and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a state of the art, fully tunable in the eight to twenty kilo electron volts. Uh, we have normally we accept proposal every six months, but for accessing uh, for structural biology work, there is a monthly proposal that can that are examined by peer review committee. So you can get a reply to your proposal in, within a month. So a state of the art a structural biology application. Now, if you don't have a single crystal for us to work at, there is also the possibility of working on uh, crystal structure determination uh, with powder diffraction. And our most performing powder diffraction beamline, uh, and here is an example of, uh, 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 can I read this? Tyro semicarbazone, did I, did I see it right? Okay. Uh, uh, will synthesize and characterize during X-ray diffraction. Uh, it's a high, widely utilized, uh, and Jasper was also the scientist in charge of our exchange program with South Africa, in case you want to uh, discuss future collaboration with South Africa. Okay, uh, something about some example of biotechnology research here. Uh, there is work done, uh, uh, for example, here you see asbestos in lung tissues, you see asbestos fibers, and you see uh, two types of, uh, uh, of uh, analytical tool. Uh, the, uh, here is a, a map of non-destructive map using X-ray fluorescence of the different chemical that are chem chemical com species present around the asbestos uh, fiber. You see an iron map. You see a magnesium map. This was uh, taken with our beam line for X-ray fluorescent microscopy, which is called TwinMIC. And uh, Alessandra is not around, but I mean, uh, uh, in class, uh, you can actually look at the same sample doing uh, fa fast Fourier transfer infrared uh, microscopy. Uh, and this is taken by C at CC. So, uh, so we do uh, analysis of uh, different uh, uh, situations, microscopic situation, you can do chemical analysis, morphological analysis, and so on. Here, you see an experiment done also with X-ray fluorescence and microscopy and, uh, uh, fast, uh, and, uh, and the infrared, and these are actually uh, um, studies of uh, the distribution of nanoparticles in the cells, and uh, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, the, the point is, uh, nanoparticles 
you include them and uh, you actually find them all over your cells. And the question is, uh, there, are, and there are more and more nanoparticles utilized in different kinds of chemicals and species from cosmetics to drugs and so forth, but the toxicology uh, at the tissue level of these new nanomaterials and it's, and it remains to be examined. And this is what uh, 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 some of what uh, Twin Mick and CC are doing in the life science area. Uh, this, I have no idea, I, I forgot which tea uh, company uh, was in, produced these uh, tea leaves, but one thing you can do is uh, you can do a, a, a take a, a, a commercial tea leaf and look at the distribution of uh, different uh, uh, elements uh, in a, in, this is what's done at Queen Mick. Uh, and you can see carbon distribution, oxygen distribution, magnesium distribution, silicon distribution, phosphorus distribution on the cell. This is a 15 micron scale. And unfortunately, you can also see aluminum, which is not good. And that uh, you can see in almost all of these T leaves examined uh, the twin meek beam line that doing X ray fluorescence uh, studies. And so that's also t nanotoxicology at the micron and submicron level. Uh, we also do things with human beings, entire human beings, okay? There is one other beam line which is called CIRMEP, which is, uh, that can operate on human patients. And there is a clinical study uh, for mammography uh, in collaboration with the central hospital, with the, whoops, sorry, with the major hospital, the uh, Catinaia, in which we compare uh, patients that have undergone a conventional mammography and the results are ambiguous, gets referred to uh, the synchronization beamline, CIRMEP, where we do a mammography which utilizes phase contrast. Because of the radiation, the synchrotron radiation is coherent, uh, we can actually measure, obtain contrast by looking at the different different phase of the radiation due to the different propagation speed in two soft tissues. So rather than having a mechanism of contrast, which is based only on the variation of density, we can actually look at the difference in propagation velocity of the radiation for tissues which have roughly the same density. And this gives you a phase shift that gives us contrast. And uh, the, you can even, even if you're not a radiologist, uh, you can compare a conventional mammography with a uh, phase contrast mammography at a reduced dose. And here is the same lesion. And here, it, your, uh, your medical doctor would say it's likely to be a benign lesion because it's rounded and there is no infiltration. But then you look at the same lesion with a phase contrast and you see that there are infiltration and there are also deposits which are characteristic deposit uh, uh, of the um, metabolic, m metabolic products of the cancer cells. And so the same lesion, uh, if you look at it with uh, phase contrast uh, here at the synchrotron, unfortunately, it's, a, it's clearly a, 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 a tumor. And this is a successful uh, uh, clinical study. Uh, the, if we will be able to actually open this, uh, to the uh, National Health Service of Italy or not, it will be a political decision at the regional level, which has to do with the cost of bringing your patients to the synchrotron, as opposed to utilizing uh, a conventional source. Uh, we have, uh, we are want to, with Electra, with the new machine, with Electra 2.0, we'll be able to actually extend the energy range to the possibility of doing faint contrast to uh, a complete uh, human being, and now you see just a test with lungs, which are in a, with the Electra 1.0, if you don't have the patient, but you just have the lungs, you can actually do phase contrast uh, with, the, with, a, with respect to a conventional CT uh, clinic, uh, and you see the advantage in these two cases, uh, but with the higher energy available with Electra 2.0, we'll be able to do this on human patients, leading human patients. And the point of this is to be able to look at uh, micron level and sub-micron level lesions and to be able to distinguish 
uh, lung cancer, from uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis without uh, having to do uh, actual uh, um, biopsies that in the case, of, in the second case, would actually be very detrimental to the patient. And uh, as far as I understand, there, there is, from our medical doctors, there is virtually no other way to do the screening of lung cancer than uh, this type of uh, future possibility. Now, uh, so far I talk about beam lines, and now I'm going to talk about uh, in-house research uh, and labs available for in-house research. And as you can see here, uh, I actually want, didn't see the picture, uh, but uh, Paola Storich will actually be telling you a little bit in the last two slides about the protein facility of Electra. Paola. Okay, uh, we have a... Uh established in Electra already some years ago from thanks to an infrared project, a, a protein facility because given the fact that uh, being crystallographer we are good in preparing protein so we have uh, exploited this uh, the facility the laboratory <coughs> is installed in Electra almost now 10 years ago and to also open this uh, capacity to external users so um, we go the whole process from the uh, initial cloning design and to the scale up of high uh, quality and a high amount of proteins for uh, structural studies and other activity studies. Of course, our main task is to obtain proteins for structural studies and crystallography, but in the way we are working now, and we collaborate uh, very much with the other beam lines in Electra, we work, uh, say, I would say, in three, in three modalities. One is a collaborative activity of research project that is internal or, or external projects that are mainly focused, I will mention later. Another is kind of a service tailor size, so we are not a big company, so we can focus on specific problem and try to help uh, who is uh, in trouble in getting proteins to solve their problems. Uh, and we also work, and this we do this mainly with uh, private companies or uh, private groups. Uh, and uh, all we do a lot of work in tutoring, in experience unit. That means if you have a PhD student that needs to start this project starting the setting up a, a new protein, uh, they need to, 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 to develop a, a, all the methods to get the protein. We normally host this, the student in our lab that is, can stay for normally two, three months, and then it's, uh, it's helped by us in starting this part, and then they normally go home with their own uh, protein, or at least all the process done. We work mostly on uh, bacteria and insect cell, bacterial based uh, system and mammalian cell expression system. Uh, this is just a focus on the internal research, on the, the topics we are more interested in. We are basically working on many uh, proteins that are targets for drug discovery, and we focus on kinases because I have a long history on kinases world. And on the other side, we are also working on the kinases. Here I've listed the, the, the most uh, uh, say active uh, project ongoing, and one is on this beta that is a putative target for Alzheimer or uh, Parkinson. There are some collaboration with the University of Fiesta and other laboratory in Italy. And then we have a project on ULK1 that is an activator of uh, um, of the, the, the say is the activator of. Um, Autophagy, sorry, <laughs> autophagy, and uh, on this we have a, a PhD student that is focusing in collaboration of the, also with the CBO in Trento, and uh, this is a very say, <coughs> characterization of the whole structure with the idea also to identify new new inhibitors that are present not existing. While for the autophagy kinases we have several collaboration with external groups, uh, but the, and we have an, an internal work on USP one that is. Uh, also an important, it's becoming an important target for many cancers, uh, cancer-related diseases, especially in glioblastoma, and we are trying to <coughs> investigate uh, this protein. We are now capable to produce this protein that's quite complicated to obtain, and it's part of a complex, and we're trying to investigate the structural element of the different part of the complex, and this is a kind of a, say, level of uh, different activities we are ongoing. Great, thank you. I'm so glad that I didn't tell to pronounce this. I was beyond my call of duty. Uh, Silvia will tell you a little bit more in the last, in the next two slides about what, uh, DNA replication and genome stability and DNA repair. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to 
And so the activity of my laboratory is involved in the structural and functional characterization of a number of proteins involved in DNA replication and DNA repair with an obvious connection to genome stability. I've been working for a long time on the replicative heavy case, MCM. I've done also some cryo-electromicroscopy because this is a protein that is very polymorphic, but unfortunately I dropped this activity when I came back to Italy because here we don't have a cryo facility. And uh, still in the field of DNA replication, we are working on CDC45, and uh, the archaeal homologs of CDC45, and uh, we've done some work with PCNA, so we managed to visualize for the first time DNA uh, bound to PCNA to try to understand how PCNA slides along DNA and interact with other proteins. In the field of DNA repair, I actually got into this because I started working on rec 4 helicase, which is involved both in DNA replication and DNA repair, and it started as a collaboration with Alessandro Vindigni, which you all know well. Uh, so rec helicases, as you know, are important in a number of genome stability process and are involved in a complex network at the interface between uh, DNA replication, repair, and recombination, and we are working on RecQ4, and uh, in particular, what we seem to uh, see is that uh, uh, the protein is actually particularly active towards RNA-DNA hybrids, and therefore are loops. We are doing mostly biochemistry, uh, besides the structural studies, but also a bit of cell biology, and here I would be glad glad to have some help from ICGP, for example. The project that we started more recently is uh, um, revolves around iron sulfur cluster helicases. It is emerging more and more that the number of proteins involved in DNA metabolism have iron sulfur clusters. And there are interesting uh, proposal that they might work through a DNA charge transfer mechanism where the protein binds to it, the DNA, gives out an electron that travels along the pi pi bond along the DNA and is actually then collected by another protein along the way. And this may be a way to detect the uh, correct arrangement of the DNA. So in the presence of uh, damage, this process will be blocked, the protein will be stuck to the DNA, and that may act as a signaling to detect damage along long stretches of DNA. We are particularly focusing on these three proteins, DBX11, which is involved in sister chromatic cohesion, FUNCJ, which is a protein which is part of the Fanconi anemia cluster of proteins, and ARTEL-1, ARTEL stays for regulator of telomere length, which is involved in telomere maintenance and DNA replication. Okay, thank you. And finally, something about the ELETA Nano Innovation Lab. Uh, and, uh, One more clip. What? Sorry. No? Okay. The, the bicycle is missing. Uh, okay, so uh, the Nano Innovation Lab is uh, a lab involved in physics and nanotechnology. And what we do, we develop a class of um, miniaturized uh, devices for the monitoring of uh, um, molecular uh, biomarkers uh, in the blood, so for lipid biopsy. And uh, we try to be multiplexing, and we can detect either microRNA circulating in blood or specific kind of proteins. And we work a lot with a group which is optimizing nanobodies for the uh, efficient uh, recognition of the antigen that we are interested in. And uh, together with the other beam lines uh, of Electra, we set up uh, a platform, a multi technique platform for the analysis of uh, um, extracellular vesicles, which are now very interesting, uh, getting more and more interest in, uh, from the scientific community uh, in correlation also with disease. So um, extracellular vesicles are uh, released by cell and bring uh, information uh, to this cell, uh, cell and uh, I mean, are very important in um, preparing the environment also for 
cancer proliferation. And so what we do, we are trying to sort the classes, uh, now the vesicle in the middle is missing, I'm sorry, but we are trying to sort the class of uh, vesicles related to specific cancer and uh, uh, classify, characterize uh, from the chemical point of view and structural point of view. And besides that, uh, since we have this atomic quartz microscope, which is uh, a nanomechanical probe, what we do, we probe also the mechanical properties of cells and cell interaction with the models of extracellular uh, environment. So we can understand how cell from cell culture interact with uh, extracellular environments of different morphology, different stiffness, and correlate to mechanical transduction. For instance, in this work, we have seen uh, then uh, in the context of uh, human aortic um, calcific human aortic, human aortic disease, we have seen that there was a, a specific pattern of stiffness correlated with the, the calcification and with the mechanical transduction with the yak translocation into the nucleus, which was typical of calcific valve, but not of stenotic valve. And of course, also this kind, this class of uh, uh, studies uh, we can perform on, in the context of uh, neurodegenerative disease or cancer and so on. And then we are doing some uh, model uh, material, <coughs> model uh, biomimetic material, so artificially with the bilayers to study interaction uh, with the protein, more, more biophysical uh, uh, setup for studies. Okay, so thank you. As you realized, I forced them to give me only two and no more than two slides. Mm -hmm. So, but with Lawrence, perhaps we'll organize another venue in which you guys can tell us a little bit more in detail what you are doing at ICGB. And some of these people will give you in more detail 30 or 40 slides as they wanted to, me to show uh, for each of them what they're doing in this situation. So let me just uh, summarize some of the stuff we talked about. Uh, so the last thing you heard of was about an innovation lab. and. Uh, Loredana is the person to contact if you have ideas about the, uh, uh, this type of applications uh, and measurements. Uh, you, thought, you heard about from CV Honesty and Power Storage about what they do in terms of uh, uh, proteins. You, we didn't, I apologize, I skipped the nano, micro and nanocarbon lab, I just didn't have the time, and I skipped the Tomo lab. If you're interested in carbon uh, nanotubes and carbon based material, the person to contact is Andrea Goldoni. If you're interested in X-ray computer and microtomography from a microfocus source conventional, uh, before Electra 2.0, you can still do something with the facility, a lab facility, and the person to contact is Luciano Mancini. You heard about the XRD1 work, the person to contact is Maurizio Volentarutti. You heard about XRD2, and the person to contact is Amy Heru. I apologize that you didn't have time to talk about uh, the Sachs beamline and the person to contact is Heinz Aminich that's co-owned and cooperated with the University of Technical University of Graf. Lisa Lakari is the person to contact with the infrared spectroscopy, FTIR, and imaging. Juliana Tromba is the person to contact about the medical diagnostic radiology phase contrast and microtomography. And uh, for what uh, uh, concern uh, non destructive X ray fluorescence microscopy, uh, scanning, and full field imaging, mm -hmm. great opportunities. The person to contact uh, is Alessandra Zanoncelli, who is not around today because she had to be elsewhere. So that's uh, uh, not all of the facilities that do some life science. So there are life science being done on other beam lines and so forth, but these are the ones that predominantly do life science application and this is the focus of this presentation. Thank you.